All right, Chris. I'm glad you uh, you're here today. Good crew. I will be uh, assisting you in uh, going through a couple of examples and a couple of things that we already covered, rather than a bit of quick. Okay, so today is really kind of a review session. Uh, before I do that, let me ask you whether or not you were able to see homework eight pop up. Some problems I noticed. Some folks had no problems in accessing it. Other people couldn't find it. Are there still folks that can find homework eight in seven? Okay, so it, it was it was available since last last Thursday when I posted it. Uh, for some technical reason, kind of glitch, I don't know where it came from. It didn't show up in, in the regular venue, but it was available in your grades section. Okay, so some people discovered that in grade two anyway. So now, for some reason, right, it's spontaneously showed up also on the regular menu, so everybody should have access to it. Make sure you uh, you start if you haven't, because it's uh, like I said, it's on week, so it's facing holidays. The homework uh, will be due uh, on Friday night, so you still have a regular uh, due date. It's not a lot of long school questions, but it's definitely uh, a little bit of work. So please uh, get started if you haven't. All right, so let me, uh, you know, go through a couple of points that I'd like to make. So next week, next Friday, is the second midterm. And I can tell you that the second midterm is uh, covering all the material uh, that, uh, that we started to talk about right after the first midterm. Okay, up to now, but not the redox part. Okay, so the redox... Uh, the topic of redox reactions will not be part of the second midterm. Everything else will be. Okay, so that includes uh, talking about chemical reactions, balancing chemical reactions, uh, calculating moles and mole ratios, calculating molarities, calculating dilutions, and working with acid-base reactions and precipitation reactions. And being able to determine with the use of mole ratios to calculate how much product you will pour through the grams or number of moles, or how much excess reagent you have left after a reaction. Those are the typical things that we did in, during the last four, uh, four weeks. Okay, so those will, will be the things that I'll be testing you on uh, next time. So, um, having said that, uh, I always like to think of you know a class like this, uh, and I've said this many times. Uh, provides you with a couple of methods, a couple of tools, and a couple, a couple of concepts that you can apply to address several outstanding problems in chemistry or physics or biology. And uh, rather than just learning things by heart, you know, just really just seeing it as, as, as lists of factors, it's more like a method that you make your, your own, okay? a method that you can use and you can apply. So you, you can, you can see that as a toolbox. I like that word because I think really that's the way it is. If you think of it that way, then typically it becomes more uh, joyful, not so painful, and, um, and it's actually useful later on. Okay? So this is another way to think about tools. Uh, in addition to tools, uh, you of course want to combine those things and use them logically. Okay? So you, you have to use your brain at the same time. Okay, so this is, a, this is the game, right? You have a couple of methods that you work with, then you want to apply those things consistently, consistently and in, in, in the right way, okay? Um, a, lot of, a lot of things that we do is mathematically or even logically really not that difficult, okay? So it doesn't involve very high level uh, understanding. It is more like trying to apply certain uh, methods and try to give them meaning. And because a lot of, lots of these things you don't, don't use in regular life, in daily life, the meaning is not so strong, and that's typically what holds people back from performing well on the exam. Because they just are not comfortable with the concepts that we work with. 
moles, more ratio of these things just don't sit well, and, and that's why we have the hiccups uh, on the exam. Mathematically, it's all just a multiplication or a division. So there's nothing super mysterious about it. So the trick is really to put these things into a logical context such that it makes sense for you. Right? So this, for instance, doesn't make a lot of sense to me. Okay? But once I learn what these things mean, I can just start to read it. And the same is true with chemistry. Right? You can learn a language. At first, it looks weird, and you can't really make any sense out of it, but you just get down to it, try to learn things, learn the ground, learn the words, and you put things together, and after a while, you just completely read those things. The same is true in chemistry. What really helps with chemistry, though, and doesn't work so well in languages, is that you can visualize the problem. When I see a, a, a question, a text problem, I always start to think, you know, what is going on here? If it talks about putting several things together in a, in a beaker, then I just visualize that. You know, four things plus six things, and then something happens. Right? These visualizations are very simple, but it can really help you put this problem into context, make it less abstract. Okay? Uh, and then you, wanna, you want to simplify things, right? And uh, we've, we've addressed that issue several times. Sometimes talking about molecules and moles and elements, moles of elements, in elements, in, uh, sorry, in molecules, maybe a little bit confusing. Uh, but you can just think of these uh, molecules and atoms in molecules as countable objects. You just have you know, some sort of this, some sort of that, put them together and something else, right? So simplify, use different things that make uh, the, uh, the, the problem easier, right? An apple, a mouth, you get something else. Right? You just put a few things together, you get something else. Really, in chemistry, that's what it comes down to. All right, so we came across several conversions, and uh, the ones that we used extensively during the past four weeks or so, since uh, the first midterm, are the following. Okay, we made conversions from moles to grams. And the relation that we used was uh, the mass of the compound, the total mass, equals the number of moles that you have times the molar mass. Okay? So the mass of the whole thing equals n times molar mass, usually indicated by big N. I can also do this vice versa. I can calculate the number of moles from knowing the molar mass and the total mass. Okay? So I know the amount of grams and I know the molar mass of the compound. And we have used this formula also many, many times. The number of moles, n equals the mass, little m, over big M, which is the molar mass. Okay? So you should be very comfortable with using these expressions. These two expressions are really the same. I just reordered them to isolate either the total mass or the number of moles. Okay? But there's three quantities here that are just related in this fashion. Knowing two of them allows you to determine the third one. Okay. We also looked at uh, concentrations. And in terms of concentrations, we could go from the number of moles to volume. Okay, so there's a relation between volume, the concentration, and the number of moles. So the volume was the number of moles over the molarity. The molarity is defined as the number of moles per liter. And using this relation of these three quantities, moles, volume, and molarity, I can cycle through and isolate either one of them. Right? For instance, uh, I can go from molarity to moles. If we know the molarity, if we don't know the number of moles, what you need to do, what you also need to know is the, is the volume. You multiply the molarity with the volume, and you get the number of moles. So we've used it several times in uh, in previous in, in the last couple of weeks. And then, of course, also uh, I can go from moles to molarity. The definition of molarity equals the number of moles over volume. So if you know the number of moles <laughs> and you know the volume, you can calculate the molarity straight away. So these last three guys here are just the same formula, the same relation between the three quantities, and I can just cycle through and use these relations comfortably. In other words, don't get stuck on an exam when you need to make a conversion from grams to moles. 
Okay, at this point, at this point, you don't want to be stuck at that level. You just want to quickly make such a uh, conversion. Okay, now let's let's look at an example. A little bit out of context, but it's the same way of thinking about quantities of things. Okay, so here's the situation: in a remote village somewhere. There, is, uh, um, there are families that have one, per one guy and three girlfriends. Right in the village. And uh, the question is, given that there are 27 girlfriends in the village, how many guys are there? All right? So you can do this in a variety of ways. I'm going to show you now how to calculate this in a way we talk about it. So in terms of the way we talk about it, what I'd like to know is a ratio between two things. Okay? I want to know how many guys are there for this many girlfriends. So what is the ratio between these two? Okay? Well, the ratio is 1 to 3. So one guy for three girlfriends. That is 0.33. Okay? I, I just think it's a more ratio. It doesn't matter if I talk about guys or girlfriends or this compound or that compound. I just have to look at the ratio between two things, two countable things. All right? So then, I, what I can do then with this ratio, I can do a conversion. Namely, 27 girlfriends has to be converted into guys. Okay? So I start with the number of girlfriends, 27, and you, do, you multiply that with this ratio, converting basically the unit of girlfriends into the unit of guys. So this ratio between two units is a conversion factor. Girlfriend unit crosses out, and I'm converting girlfriends into guys. Very interesting. Think about it. But that's just what happens in this calculation. Nine guys is your answer. You know, you could have done this very quickly. You read this, and oh, 27, okay, one to three, I divide this by three, so I get nine. That's, that's of course correct, right? I'm going to show you the analogy with this calculation we do. Countable things, two kinds of countable things, two different kinds of things, species A, species B, can be related to ratio, and that means that you can always convert one into the other with that ratio, like we did over here. Okay, another example, marbles. And it says each bag of marbles contains four blue marbles, five white ones, and 12 red marbles. The total number of red marbles is 144. And then the question is, how many blue marbles are there? There's a nice playground exercise over here. See if you can do this. So you can do this again in a variety of ways. There's not one single unique way to do it. I'm just showing this example that in a kind of a mundane situation like this, we can use our mechanisms and they should work properly. I just want you to think in terms of ratios, more ratios or ratios between two things that are counting. Okay, so intuitively, you would probably do this. You say, okay, hold on a second. I know there's 144 red marbles, okay? And each bag has 12 red marbles. So if I divide 144 by 12, I get the number of bags, okay? This is what you would do intuitively, at least that's what I would do. So you say 144 divided by 12, 12 bags, and each bag then has four blue marbles. So 12 times 4 equals 48 blue marbles. Okay? So this is what you may have done back in the day, during recess, when you were putting your marbles out. And engaging in competitions, uh, getting the most number of marbles. That's what I did when I was a child. Nowadays, everybody's iPods, the kids are, but actually he brought marbles out of the playground. Okay? So, let's do the same calculation now, not in this intuitive way, but a taller way, but in the way that uh, the method of using ratio of quantum objects. Okay, so, what I have to do is a conversion, a conversion between two things, namely, red marbles to blue marbles. That's the conversion. So I always start with the number of red marbles. If I want to convert one thing into something else, I need to know the relation between those two things. Okay, what is the relation? Do I know that? Yeah, no. Four blue to 12 red. 
for each four blues, there's 12 reds. Okay, I put the red at the bottom, the blue one on the top, because I want to make the conversion from red to blue, like this. So red model unit crosses out, I convert red into blue, and I get 48. Right? So this is a, this is a good way to think about countable objects of different kinds, and you're related to one another. It's exactly the same way of thinking that we apply to chemical equations. Okay? All right, so let's do something more chemical then. Yes? Yeah, you can do that. You can simplify that if you want to do that. You can make it, yeah, but it's not necessary, right? It's just a ratio that matters. You don't have to simplify the ratio. You can just work with the numbers in the back. The ratio is a ratio. OK, so here I have a, a bag of uh, this stuff, aluminum sulfate. And it says that the sample contains two moles of sulfate ions. The question then is, how many moles of aluminum ions do I have? OK, so this is exactly the same problem as before. Namely, I have two things. Okay? I have sulfate ions and aluminum ions. I know the number of sulfate ions. I do not know yet the number of aluminum ions. Do I know the relation between the two? Yes, I do. Let's give it over here. For each three sulfates, you have two aluminums. Okay? That's all I need to know. So what I do is I list the number of sulfate ions. I have two mole of them. I convert that to aluminum. How? Well, look, the ratio is right there. For each two moles of aluminum, I have three moles of sulfate. That's what this, that is what this uh, formula says. Sulfate units crossing out, I get moles of aluminum. That means for each two moles of sulfate, you have 1.3 moles of aluminum ions. Now, with this, of course, I can do subsequent calculation. Knowing the number of moles of something allows you to determine also directly how many grams you have of something. I just multiply the mole with the uh, molar mass of aluminum, and I get the amount in terms of grams. Or I can multiply this number of mole by how many things there are in a mole, which is Avogadro's number. So I multiply the mole number with how many things there are in a mole, I get the total number expressed in the actual quantity. Okay? So these are just two quick conversions from mole to either grams or the absolute number of the countable object, in this case, the number of aluminum. All right, another example. This is a massive sentence <coughs> example. And uh, we haven't really done too much of these, but this one I remind you uh, that we should be able to solve these problems. So let's have a look. In this case, I have a certain volume of a solution or acetic acid. Here it is. And the density is given. OK. So the density of the total solution is given, and the volume of the total solution is given as well. Uh, it says then, I have this much of arsenic acid. And knowing this, I need to calculate the mass percentage of this stuff in the solution. Now, this is a question. I don't think we have done a question exactly like this, but it shouldn't matter. Okay? You don't have to be able to, you shouldn't be able to solve just questions you've done before. You should be able to solve questions you have not done. Right? This is something we should be able to calculate. For a mass percentage, you need two things. You need the contribution of the thing, that is the mass percentage, and the total, total over the contribution of, in this case, arsenic acid. So I need to know the amount of grams of arsenic acid, and I need to know the total amount of gram of the solution, the total. So that those two are two things I need to calculate here. And I can do both. Everything is given, OK? Here is a volume. I need the amount in grams. How do I do that? Well, look, there's a density here. All right. So what I can do is, I have volume here. Multiply by density gives me mass. That's one of the relations we learned about in the first part of this course. Right? Relation of density. Density times volume equals mass. 
only thing you have to be uh, careful about is this unit over here. It says kilograms per meter cubed. If I take a thousand of a, of a kilogram, which is one gram, okay, and a thousand of a meter cubed, which is one decimeter cubed, which is a liter, I get the same density expressed in grams per liter. Okay, so this is a quick conversion I made here without spelling it out explicitly. The unit of kilograms per meter cubed is the same as grams per liter. If you do this calculation, you find that the mass is 296.96 grams. That is the mass of the total solution. Next, you can calculate the mass of just your acetic acid. How do you do that? Well, look, I have the number of moles. The only thing I have to do is to multiply it with the mole mass. Okay, so here it is. Number of moles times the molar mass of arsenic acid. You have to kind of calculate that towards directly from the PR table. If you do that, you find 50, sorry, 65.29 grams of arsenic acid. Those are the two ingredients I need. Total mass of the solution, contribution from arsenic acid, will allow me to calculate the mass percentage. So here it is. The ratio of uh, 65 and 296 times 100%, and that will give me 20%. That is the mass percentage. So involve, that basically involve two conversions, one from volume to uh, mass, and from number of moles to mass. Those are the conversions I have to do. And these are conversions we are familiar with, right? This is nothing serious. Okay, let's continue. Here's another interesting one. And if you read this, you may freak out. Because you feel like, hey, I've never done a question exactly like that. And that's exactly the point. Okay? Know what you're knowing, you should be able to do a question that you maybe haven't done before. Just by applying those tools that you have in your mind. Okay, so here it says a compound with a certain molar mass. The molar mass of a compound is given here. That's it. It contains an element in the molecular formula with a subscript 10. All right? And that element is 61.85 grams per 100 grams of the compound. And from this, I should be able to calculate the molar mass of that element. Okay. So uh, let's visualize this. I have a compound. The molecular formula is not known, but what I do know is there's an element in there in subscript, subscript 10. And that means that for each one mole of the compound, I have 10 moles of that element. Right? So the ratio is 10. For each one mole of the compound, the unknown compound, I have 10 moles of the element that we're talking about. Now this element contributes 61.85 grams for each 100 grams of the compound. That means that's a, that's a mass, mass percentage, right? One mole of the compound is this much, that's given here. So if I have one mole of the compound, I have 194. How much of that is contributed by the element? Well, here, 61.85% of that mass is that element, right? So from this, I have a mass percentage. The mass percentage comes in handy now. This many percent of that is what that element contributes to one mole. There it is, the total amount of one mole of compound. That is the percentage of contribution of the element. That means the element contributes 120.1 grams per mole of the compound. Not per mole of the element. It is per mole of the compound. In order to find out the mole mass of the element, I need to convert more of the compound into more of the element. How? Well, here it is. That's the ratio between the two. I have to convert a unit, the unit of mole of compound into mole of the element. I have to go from one over mole of the compound to one over mole of the element. So what I do is this. Okay? This has to cross out. That means mole of the compound has to go on top. This one has to go at the bottom, like this. This one is at the bottom. Here it's at the top, so this crosses out, and now I have more of the element as the unit 
which is now the denominator, as it should be. Okay? What I have is 12.01 gram per mole of the element. That is the molar mass of the element. Okay? Which element is that? Carbon. Okay? So this may look very strange at first, but just go through this slide and convince yourself that we don't do anything magical here. Okay? This is just applying the same way of thinking to a problem like this. Okay, so this is a, an actual point. Usually, you have a unit that sits there, and you put the unit at the bottom, and you cross it out, right? What do you do when it is actually the denominator that you want to cross out? Well, that's exactly what this problem shows. You put that thing you want to cross out on top, and the other guy you want to go to is the denominator you want to have, right? It doesn't, it's exactly the same way, but this denominator, it appears under the line, that means your new unit has to be under the line. Right? It's just an inverse of the, of the regular way. Just look at this formula and see that indeed this is crossing out against that. It means you're left with rules of the element. So you take the inverse. If it is a numerator that you want to replace, you put the new unit as the numerator. If it is a denominator you want to replace, you put the new unit as the denominator. Okay, another example. Uh, here's an equation, chemical equation. What I have to calculate here is the number of pro uh, product units that I generate given a certain amount of this starting materials. Now, the funny thing about this question is, it doesn't say how many grams or how many moles I have, it says how many units I have. And that may throw you off guard. But that's not necessary. Okay. That's why I do two of these examples here. Because units doesn't mean anything else but molecules. You just have a certain number of aluminum, a certain number of oxygen molecules, okay? And these are countable things. If they were expressed in actual number of molecules or in moles, the ratios behave in exactly the same fashion. Okay, so I can just pretend that this says moles as opposed to units. It doesn't matter for the math, it's exactly the same. So let's do that. What I have to do then is to calculate how, many, how much product do I form? That's the question. Not expressed in moles or grams, but expressed in units. So I apply the regular way of doing this. First, I would like to know which one of the reagents is the limiting reagent. How do you do that? Well, I like to do it in this way. I look at the mole ratio according to the equation, which is I need three moles of oxygen for each four mole of aluminum. The ratio of aluminum over oxygen is 1.3. And then I look at how many of these things do I actually have? What is the ratio of <coughs> Okay, so the actual ratio is this many aluminum over that many oxygen. The fact that it's given in atoms or units doesn't matter for the ratio, right? I can multiply this with Avogadro's number and this would have a garbage number, and then it would be in moles, the ratio would be the same. Doesn't matter. Yeah. If I multiply something of the, if I multiply the numerator, the numerator or the denominator with the same number, I get the same ratio. Okay, so the ratio is 1.25. This is less than that, and that means the numerator is the limiting reagent. Knowing that, I take the amount of the limiting reagent and convert that into the amount of product. That is the next step. Here it is. I have the limiting reagent. This is how many I have of the limiting reagent. I want to convert that into the amount of product. How do you do that? Well, with the ratio between the two. Okay? For each four of these, I, I generate two of those. Okay? I want to go to this, so I put that on top. Two of these for each four of the limiting reagent, aluminum. This will cross out, okay? And I get my answer in units or, you know, copy numbers or molecules of, of this aluminum or 
oxide. So I had 1 on 26 units of aluminum oxide. And that's it. That's the answer. OK. Uh, let's do one more of the same flavor. Kind of the same properties. But now, not determining the amount of product that I pour, but how much of the excess reagent is left. Remember, this is another type of question that we have done several times. And I do it in the same kind of way. I just keep units there. And I'm not going to bother with grams or moles. I just want to show you the basic way of thinking here. I have to calculate the number of excess reagents remaining after this reaction has completed. The number of reagents at the beginning are given here and there. Okay? So I proceed in exactly the same fashion. I'd like to know which one is the limit of the reagent. Okay, so I take the ratio of the two. Uh, I have four mole of this guy and 25 moles of oxygen according to the equation. Okay, these are big numbers. It doesn't matter. Okay? The math is still the same. These numbers don't have to be one or two or beautiful uh, small numbers. No, they can be very awkward. It doesn't matter. The ratio is a ratio. 0 0.60. Then I'm going to take the ratio between these two numbers, the actual amount of the molecules that I have. 412 over 2400. And that equals 0.171. Very close to this. But clearly this is bigger. If this is bigger, then the denominator is the limiting reagent. Okay? So oxygen is the limiting reagent. It will run out first. That means that the other guy is the excess reagent. And so I have something of this left. And that's what I have to determine. How much of these guys do we have left after the reaction has come to the stop? OK? <coughs> how much is left is determined by how many oxygen you have. The limiting reagent determines the quantities after the reaction has stopped. OK, so I, I take the number of the limiting reagent, and I'd like to convert that into how much of the excess reagent has reacted with the oxygen. Okay, so what you do is you convert oxygen into the number of the other reagents. So I have to relate two reagents to one another. For each 25 units of oxygen, I take with four units of the other reagent. This one crosses out, and I get this number here is the number of reagents reacted here. The excess reagent this many units have reacted and are now gone. Okay? They, have been, they have been converted into the products. I had at the beginning 412. This many, 384, have vanished in the reaction. They have reacted and formed products together with the oxygen. Okay? That means I have 28 left after the reaction is come through. That's how many I've left. Okay, so we've done these calculations several times. I want to just point out that you can do is you convert one countable unit into the other countable unit with these ratios. Okay? One reagent you convert into the other reagent, the amount of the other reagent that has reacted. Okay. Is this clear, folks? Yeah? Who says I still have no idea what you're talking about? Great. All right, then I'm going to tip this off with uh, showing a couple of acid base reactions. Acid base reactions, you've seen a couple of examples with lacquer. I want to show you some other flavors of reactions that you may not have seen. I'm just going to show them to you that these are the same kind of reactions that uh, you've uh, dealt with, uh, just with different species. So let's have a look. See ammonia here, and here you see perchloric acid. Now, perchloric acid will give up this guy and will be accepted by this uh, ammonia molecule. Ammonia, therefore, acts like a base. So it becomes, it accepts this proton, this one loses the proton. Now, this uh, equation actually is not completely correct because this backward arrow is very unlikely. Perchloric acid is a strong acid. Okay, so it will be irreversible. So this arrow is just not correct. 
Okay. Carboxylic acids are an important class of, um, of acids. Okay. We've seen them in our line structures quite a bit. The carboxylic acid has this unit here. It has a carbon with one double bond of oxygen and then one OH attached to it. That is called a carboxylic acid. Why is it an acid? Because this H can split off. And the way to write that in a molecular formula is as follows. Okay? Either the H appears in the front or it appears like this, OOH. So in the case of carboxylic acids, the H can actually appear as the last element in the molecular formula. Every time you see in the molecular formula this pattern, OOH, you know this is the H that's going to split up. Okay? These are truly weak acids, so that's why the double arrow here is appropriate. And uh, this H splits off, it forms the anion, so it becomes a minus, and this H plus goes into solution. Okay, so every time you see something like this, it looks like this, you should recognize, oh, this is a carboxylic acid, it is a weak acid, and I can do calculation. Mineral acids, like sulfuric acid, okay? Uh, we've seen it before. Sulfuric acid is a funny acid because it has two hydrogens. Two hydrogens. The first hydrogen splits off very efficiently. The second one can also split off. So what you have in the end then is two hydrogens plus sulfate. But the last step is actually not a strong acid. It's a weak acid. So whenever you have H as a 4 minus left in the solution, that is a weak acid. That's why there's a reversible situation. So there's a backward error. The intermediate step is not shown here. I just want to show you that these acids that have multiple hydrogens can actually split off multiple hydrogens. Okay. Let's look at a couple of more reactions of some funny looking compounds. For instance, have you ever seen this? BF4. <coughs> no, we haven't. Okay. Tetrafluoroborate. That is an anion. But you don't have to know this anyone necessarily. The only thing you have to know is H is the one that's splitting off. Okay, this is a weak acid. And the anion, BF4 minus, is just the rest anion, polyatomic anion that sits in solution. This H then will combine with the OH minus of potassium hydroxide. Okay, so it forms water, and in solution you have potassium <coughs> tetrafluoroborate lab uh, in the solution. Okay, another interesting example. Ammonium sulfate is interacting with barium hydroxide. I know the hydroxide anion is a very strong base. So it will take a proton wherever it can. Can it get a proton from something like here? Yes, it can. This ammonium cation has an extra H that it can get rid of. Remember? Because Ammonia is a weak acid. You can accept this H, you also give it back. That means this OH minus is glad to take that extra proton from the NH4 plus. Okay? So when it takes a proton, the NH4 plus becomes NH3 neutral, it becomes ammonia. The OH minus interacts with the proton, becomes water, and what you're uh, left with is barium sulfate. Barium sulfate actually is precipitate. This is a very interesting situation, right? I have an acid-base reaction that has as a product a precipitate. <coughs> We're combining two, two things here. Acid-base and precipitation reaction. It's happening. Precipitation just happened. The precipitation reaction simply means that you have two salts in solution that when combined, all the compounds are in soil. That's exactly what's taking place right here. OK, another example. Here you see HSO4. HSO4 minus is the product when you put sulfuric acid in solution. The H splits off. The anion generates HSO4 minus. But I told you, this extra H can still split off if you combine it with a strong uh, base. So what happens is the strong base, OH minus, takes off this last 
H that is attached to the sulfate. And so it becomes sodium sulfate, this H is now gone, this H combines with OH minus to form water. Okay, very last example. This is an example we have already seen. I just want to list it one, once again. Be familiar with what ammonia does. Ammonia accepts a proton, uh, and if you have a strong acid, then it's a unidirectional reaction. Okay? So it will form ammoni sorry, ammonium chloride. Okay? This H goes to this, forms the ammonium ion. And what you have in solution that is ammonium chloride. Everything that is listed here is written in the molecular equation format. Okay? If you have to write this in the net ionic, or the ionic equation, then of course it is NH4 plus aqueous plus chlorine minus aqueous. Okay? These are ionic uh, species of solution. <coughs> all right, folks. That's all I got. I'll see you next week. Happy Thanksgiving.